welcome back again and uh, i hope you have enjoyed the sri lankan theme presentation which has given a glimpse to you uh, about uh, the sri lankan culture in the past and what were the preventive measures that were followed by the sri lankans during that time period and that uh, session was shared both in a uh, zoom as well as social media because uh, we wanted to make it open to all the general public as well so we we thank those artists and the resource persons who have joined with us uh, to give a glimpse of the ancient sri lanka and the traditions of the country to the international audience now uh, after these uh, uh, light activities and reflections now we are moving back into the next symposium again a very important area and a topic uh, that is related to the uh, new normal concept because with the under covid pandemic it and surveillance the use of information technology to to control the con uh, covid pandemic is become has become very important so today uh, i uh, i am co-chairing with dr yuan and lu who is from university of hawaii usa and uh, his uh, regional director of uh, United States of America related to the APAC and one of the long standing members and the executive committee members of APAC. Uh, Yuan and Lu, before we move into the session, you can introduce yourself and greet the audience as well. Thank you, Anna Indika. Uh, my name is Yuan and Lu. I'm uh, very pleased that you be here and to share this and uh, symposium with Indika. Uh, Right now, I'm with the University of Hawaii School of Public Health. Uh, my training is in the virology. So uh, I have been working with the virus and uh, for my pretty much entire life with different types of the virus. Of course, the COVID is a very different one. Yeah, so it pre presents a lot of challenges to global wise public health security. Uh, not of like, you know, the infection and the not about the human and uh, you know loss of their life due to the infection of the disease so i think uh, how to uh, the management of the, you know the disease and use that you know like uh, some kind of surveillance system and uh, enhance the future and the prevention and the control of the disease is very important so uh, we are going to have three on the speakers on that today uh talk about the you know like uh, some surveillance systems uh so indica you want to introduce the first one uh, yeah, speaker. I, I, I'll start with the, introducing the first speaker. Uh, yes. Um, the, our first speaker is Dr. Pamod Amarakon, uh, who is training to become a specialist in medical informatics uh, under the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine in Sri Lanka. And he has done a lot of work during this COVID pandemic related to the development and improvement of IT work. Actually, He's a member of uh, the Council of the Sri Lanka Medical Association and ha has supported and been a pillar of strength to my interest and work related to IT and how to move towards uh, it's how to move the Sri Lanka Medical Association towards the new normal. And uh, he has contributed a lot towards the IT development of this APEC 2020 conference as well. So Pamod will be talking about origin of COVID-19 surveillance system on the DG. IHS platform in Sri Lanka. Even though this platform is mentioned as Sri Lanka, uh, many international countries and organizations are already making use of this system. Over to you, Pamod. Good afternoon, good evening, uh, good morning to all of you from uh, wherever you are joining. Uh, so within next 20 to 30 minutes time, I expect to uh, talk briefly about uh, how we developed a digital COVID-19 surveillance system in Sri Lanka based on the available resources and an open source platform which of course has been now taken up uh, at global level by more than 50 countries. And uh, during the symposium, uh, we will talk more about how this uh, innovation that started in Sri Lanka progressed as a global uh, public good uh, within last couple of months. So uh, first of all, a little bit of history about uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We all know that uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, initially an outbreak uh, started off in uh, December 2019 in China and Sri Lanka being a country in Southeast Asia uh, we reported our first COVID-19 case on 27th January 2020 
but by the time one uh, concern that sri lanka ministry of health had was that we did not have an integrated digital surveillance system for covid-19 related information requirements so what the ministry of health especially the uh, 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 directorate of uh, health information at ministry of health what they did was they started off a discussion on around 20th january 2020 uh, with the experts in health informatics in sri lanka and especially in the ministry of health to decide on how to build this kind of a platform in a short span of time so we had so many concerns for the ministry being a, a, a developing country we were kind of uh, really short with the resources so the the list really goes on but if i mention one by one one major concern was that covid-19 is not affecting the health domain itself so we needed to share the data related to covid-19 among several stakeholders within the ministry of health as well as outside the ministry of health and also the system i mean we could not stop the pandemic till we develop a system so the system had to be up and running in a very short span of time most probably in like few days and then of course uh, the government uh, being a government entity the ministry of health usually uh, our uh, information systems development uh, has a procurement process which is a kind of a lengthy one and we did not have time to uh, wait for this lengthy procurement process and then again initially we wanted to uh, in, um, establish the system in a few institutes in the ministry of health and as the disease progress and and uh, we get more requirements we needed to scale it up uh, up to i mean uh, nationally uh, using so uh, across so many organizations within the ministry of health and of course uh, the most certain thing about the pandemic is the uncertainty so it affected our information domain as well because there was a lot of uncertainty we did not know how to prepare our systems requirements specification document initially because the system requirements were keeping on changing and then of course uh, we needed to have some fine access control due to the fact that we had a lot of stakeholders joining like even within the ministry of health there was some sensitive, sensitive information which needed to be shared only within uh, a particular directorate and of course uh, we did not have too much time to allocate for this entire process and uh, the resources were of course uh, very limited uh, we we could not conduct our usual training programs due to obvious uh, requirements of phys physical distancing so we had to think about how to train the end users all the way up to the grassroots level and of course uh, uh, in certain uh, 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 point of data collection like uh, at the field level we might have to collect data in mobile devices and we could not really afford to collect data in uh, laptops so we had to consider that as well and of course uh, if there are if there were existing information systems within the ministry of health or else uh, outside the ministry we had to think of how to integrate uh, rather than reinventing the wheel and of course uh, as i mentioned previously it was uh, all about uncertainties uh, we did not know about the nature of the disease how it progress and what kind of effect it might have now i'm talking about uh, january and february 2020 now that we have a fair good of uh, idea about uh, uh, how it impacts the country but at that time these was uh, there was so much of uh, uncertainty involved and with regard to health systems preparedness uh, we were not sure whether we had all the resources especially the hardware networking and sufficient amount of training uh, and of course whether what kind of impact this covid-19 would have on other other sectors than health system and then if that is the case how to share this data with the multi sector stakeholders and of course uh, related to the information system uh, we had uh, so much of uncertainty about requirements uh, how fast we should deliver each uh, component in the system and how to implement and how to train and to scale up so it it was a whole bunch of uncertainties that we had to deal with at that time so uh, after doing a little bit of research uh, the the team of experts in the ministry of health uh, health information unit they they explored the possibility of using available technologies and one good thing was that uh, the sri lankan public health system was already using several digital technologies for their routine data collection which uh, we thought could be of use so we decided to go ahead with the dhis2 platform which is a free and open source health management information system which is currently used used by more than 70 countries at ministry of health level uh, at at a global scale so we decided to use dhis2 
but then again um, the this dhs2 platform is a, is a very user friendly platform we which does not require too much of coding uh, knowledge or or uh, getting software developers involved you can customize the system the platform to suit your country's requirements so we decided to uh, customize the dhs2 based on the existing requirements so with that we were able to uh, develop six modules related to covid-19 which i'll be briefly mentioning uh, in, in next few slides so that was our major path but then again we realized that there were some requirements which we could not cater uh, by customizing the dhs2 instance which required custom uh, uh, software development but we did not want to go to a, a total custom solution because it will be a, a big overhead to the uh, end users and the system as well so Uh, luckily, the DHS, uh, being a platform, it supports development of web applications on top of the platform. So we can get custom user interfaces and um, as well as custom workflows within the platform itself, which was a great relief. So we had to develop certain modules as well, but of course we were short-staffed. So what we did was we uh, got ourselves engaged with the ICT, the government ICT agency. and uh, they collaborated with other stakeholders volunteer developers and they organized a hackathon to produce these modules so with these customized and uh, the developed modules we were able to get this covid-19 surveillance package for sri lanka which was developed uh, over the next few months time so this system uh, we did user trainings mostly online user trainings and user training and then we were able to put it into local use being a free and open source platform the dhis2 has a large community so we shared our experience in developing this system in in early months in january and february in the dhis2 community and the community with the uh, involvement of university of oslo was able to design a uh, dhis2 based generic covid-19 digital health uh, toolkit which was then adopted by more than 50 countries as of this point so this is how the small work that we started off in sri lanka uh, went up to a global scale for covid-19 surveillance so let me briefly introduce to you uh, the modules that are already there in the system so we started off initially in uh, late january with the first module which was the port of entry program because at that time uh, the main requirements was to track uh the incoming tourists to the country when they uh, leave the airport and and they are in the community the public health staff uh, needed to do some routine follow up follow up so for that requirement we developed ports of entry program so we started off with that program uh, uh, in january and uh, it, it was the only module that we had uh, till february but then again with the change in disease landscape as well as government policy decisions because towards mid march sri lanka decided that they will have a mandatory quarantine uh, implemented for all passengers who is entering country uh, in government quarantine centers so with that uh, the government decision they had a information the new information requirement so we uh, customize a quarantine uh, module quarantine system uh, centers module in in the dhis2 to, to capture that requirements and then of course uh, with of course in increasing number of cases we had um, invoke patients who were treated in covid-19 treatment centers to collect their information we implemented another module uh, in hospitals and of course uh, with the initial wave uh, that was i mean we started off with ports of entry program we had some data that we needed to collect from the community level so uh, this package from the beginning they it supported collection of data uh, at community that is medical officer of health level uh, by public health inspectors and we further scaled it up uh, in months of uh, march and april and again uh, uh, with the requirement of uh, rt pcr and uh, pcr based diagnosis and transfer uh, identification of patients there was this, another module developed for laboratories uh, again in the month of march and april and followed by that there were few other modules that were custom developments uh, for example the icu bed tracking and um, covid-19 contact mapping visualization in addition as you can see towards the uh, left side of this uh, slide there were few integrations for example um, rather than uh, to to ease the burden of data entry at the ports of entry we decided to have an integration with the ministry of foreign affairs system so that we uh, we can pull the information from the uh, passenger database rather than enter all social, uh, demographic data Uh, at the airports which was huge burden and again uh, uh, likewise we were able to integrate with few other information systems that were already there in the country and in addition there were uh, 
uh, existing third party applications to which we, we sought uh, the uh, possibility of sharing information from this surveillance system. This was made possible uh, due to the fact that DHIS2 having already a, a web API through which uh, you can share information uh, based on uh, the given credentials. So let me also mention a timeline of implementations. As you can see, uh, we started off in uh, January uh, with the first uh, uh, implementation of ports of entry followed by that uh, we had a bit of a uh, uh, I mean not so happening time during the February with only ports of entry module but as the COVID-19 cases increased we had uh, again within six weeks period we had another seven modules developed into the system and the system was already uh, uh, to be implemented in the entire country uh, by the end of May. Right. So briefly mentioning about the innovations that were in place. So the system, because it was built on DHS2 platform, it has all the uh, analytics cap capabilities built into the system. We did not have to focus much on analysis. So the dashboards, uh, visualizations based on graphs, charts, uh, and uh, GIS mapping was already in place. But in addition, we, as I mentioned before, we were able to uh, get few custom developments for uh, as you can see here, this is just a uh, very simple data collection form for aggregate data collection. Again, another data collection form. But this one, uh, what you're seeing here is a basic contact mapping visualization uh, application we developed in the month of March on top of DHS2 platform. So this initial development was again further developed as a generic application under DHIS2 by the uh, help of DHIS2 community and the University of Oslo to produce something like this, which is a uh, generic uh, contact mapping visualization, which is now being used uh, in global level. In addition, we were also, we had this issue, uh, especially in the month of March and April, uh, because uh, with the rising number of critical, critically ill patients, uh, the hospitals needed to know uh, where is the nearest ICU bed available? So to do that, we have, we develop a module for ICU bed tracking based on the requirements. And in addition, there were, there was another integration uh, with the uh, telcos, uh, the telecommunication companies uh, to assist in uh, contact tracing where with the permission of the patient and with the permission of the government, uh, where the public health epidemiology staff were, uh, had the capability of tracking uh, location of a patient uh, in a given period of time. As you can see here in this context, within the last two weeks, we were able to see uh, what were the locations the patient has traveled based on the locations obtained from telecommunication towers. So likewise, uh, this is the system, which is uh, as, of, um, uh, as of right now. So we have the COVID-19 surveillance system, which is a central system based on DHIS2, which has all these modules integrated and few other third-party applications, which are again developments in the Ministry of Health, as well as other organizations, which are pushing the data, as well as obtaining data from the system with given permissions, to uh, analyze further. For example, the GIS mapping system of the West, uh, developed by the Western Province uh, Health Ministry is, an, uh, is a classic example where they try to uh, visualize, especially uh, uh, focusing on GIS mapping based on the data that is obtained from the uh, COVID-19 central surveillance system. So all this was made possible not because of technology. So it's always about technology processes as well as people. So we had uh, an enabling environment which made all this possible. First of all, the high level and multi-sector collaboration. So we had very good collaborations with the COVID-19 task force and the higher administration of the Ministry of Health as well as other uh, non uh, other agencies, uh, department institutes outside the Ministry of Health. So for example, we were working very closely with the ICT government ICT agency, immigration department, that's, uh, with which we were able to establish um, good relationships, which was not possible previously. So COVID-19 made possible to uh, develop and establish collaborations uh, between the ministries and other stakeholders, which was not so easy task uh, before the pandemic. So this is one uh, one classic example is the organization of uh, the hackathon because we needed to develop uh, uh, web applications on top of an existing platform, which is never an easy task. And we did not have uh, relevant budgetary allocations from the ministry for this purpose. So this is when the government ICT agency, what they did was they advertise this requirement on their social media platforms. And with that call, 
there were uh, so many developers who's working who's having their regular jobs they they volunteered to develop uh, uh, web applications on dhsu platform based on the requirements provided by the ministry of health so that was just uh, uh, we, uh, over a weekend that uh, all this initiated and they were able to finish uh, the initial uh, development of the three applications within two weeks due to the collaboration and of course, uh, Sri Lanka had a uh, very good uh, um, uh, capacity uh, and the infrastructure well in place. So Sri Lanka had doctors, medical doctors, specializing in health informatics, a program, a postgraduate program, which started off uh, 10 years ago, uh, which produced the relevant um, capacity within the ministry at all levels, at national as well as uh, district level, who are leading these uh, implementations because uh, it's not all about developing something at national level. We needed uh, good human resources to uh, take it up to the district and ground level, which uh, coordination of a uh, uh, task of that magnitude is never possible uh, just by having resources at national level. So this is one classic example where uh, the, the, the specially trained doctors who were, uh, who were at provincial and district level contributed, especially in um, the inducer training as well as uh, uh, troubleshooting. So they were a great asset uh, to function this system. And again, um, uh, Sri Lanka was, uh, or even though Sri Lanka is an island, uh, Sri Lanka was not an island in this uh, information domain because Sri Lanka was well connected with the global DHS2 community uh, and the, uh, it, uh, the global HISP network. I think uh, Prof. Yon Bro, uh, who will be talking next, will, um, uh, will elaborate further on this network which really made possible uh, sharing of the knowledge from uh, Sri Lanka uh, to a global level. And again, uh, the Ministry of Health had a very good uh, public health infrastructure. They had the relevant uh, people in place at provincial, district and ground level uh, who were already uh, doing surveillance activities through the epidemiology unit as well as other services uh, like maternal and child health through the Family Health Bureau of the Ministry of Health. So these uh, uh, health staff who were already using uh, the DHS2 platform uh, for other activities uh, could, I mean, they, they could easily adapt to the new modules that we implemented in the system. And then again, the volunteer developers. Uh, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a great assist Sri Lanka has, like uh, when there's the need, uh, people volunteer. So there were really good quality developers who volunteered their time and effort to get this uh, few uh, additional requirements developed within the platform, uh, which was actually what made this possible. And in addition, uh, the platform itself, because DHIS2 being a free and open source platform uh, uh, was a major asset because the government had did not have to uh, uh, put much of, uh, I mean, uh, they did not have to spend on software licensing, so we can uh, get it up and running really fast. And then, of course, because it was a customizable platform, uh, the specially tra trained uh, human resources who were already trained in using and customizing DHS2, they could uh, just proceed without the requirement of getting software developers uh, involved in throughout the process. And then again, because of that, we could do rapid prototyping because we could not just uh, uh, present the administrators, health administrators concepts, but rather we had to pr produce them some working prototype so that they can have a look at it and decide whether this could be implemented. So this rapid prototyping was really made possible uh, due to the nature of the platform itself. And then again, uh, DHIS2 is not just one software, like in case if uh, the, the, the requirements uh, of uh, the country is not, uh, is too much to be fulfilled using the existing applications of the platform, uh, DHIS2 supports development of the web applications within the platform. So how it benefits is that uh, the end user will be using just one system. He can just log into the system and there'll be a separate application, just like a plugin that you see in most of the uh, uh, the websites and uh, uh, stuff like that. So it's just a, a plugin that uh, that is installed in the system itself, which will extend the functionality of the existing system. So this web app platform was a classic example how DHIS2 was truly uh, considered as a uh, platform and not just a software. And then again, we were able to establish integrations because there were so many people working uh, towards a common goal. So to make sure that people's efforts are not uh, gone wasted, we, we ensured that integrations are happening so that we can further develop the system and we can get all the data required, required from other sources which are already in place. 
The next thing is, of course, uh, the networking, um, because Sri, uh, as I mentioned before, we were part of uh, the global HISP community. And then uh, in, the, in the DHS2 community, uh, as you can see in this slide, uh, this was when first we shared about what we did uh, in February. So based on that, there was a lot of uh, people with interest who wanted to uh, take this forward. And so they provided inputs. And based on that and the collaborations uh, with the University of Oslo, at, uh, uh, at, at that level, they were able to expand on this uh, toolkit that was already prepared in a generic way so that uh, most of the other countries in the world could use it. Because initial solution that was developed in Sri Lanka was kind of um, a customized element to our requirements. But then again, you can obviously uh, uh, expand it a bit further to make it generic. So that's what uh, the DHS2 community did, uh, which was then uh, adopted by so many other countries. And then, of course, uh, as you can see here, there were not just one component, uh, just like in Sri Lanka's use case, uh, in, in this global level, the DHS2 metadata toolkit. Uh, had all these modules. So some of the modules, especially the port of entry module, was uh, mostly uh, the version that was used in Sri Lanka's context, but then a uh, few other modules were developed based on the generic requirements identified. So this is how uh, the innovation that took place in Sri Lanka benefited Sri Lanka, and, and not only that, it could uh, expand further uh, to have uh, a global presence. So I will uh, conclude my presentation with this final slide where the Prime Minister of Norway uh, mentions in a, in a public forum, um, I'm quoting her, innovative approach uh, Sri Lanka has used now been adopted by more than 30 countries including Norway. So uh, like there have been so many questions raised in public health communities, especially in uh, uh, digital health communities about uh, these kind of free and open source software. Why are they only being used in developing countries? But pandemics sometimes really make uh, the entire world feel and understand the real use of uh, free and open source systems, uh, just as in the use case of Norway, which is using a software which is uh, coordinated by the, uh, the country itself, but mostly present in Asia and Africa. And uh, this software is now being ev even utilized in Norway for the COVID-19 surveillance. So thank you so much. I think uh, pandemic was in that way blessing in disguise to show the needs and the applications of different IT systems which are available open source. Ron, uh, my co-chairperson, can you introduce the next speaker? Yeah, the next speaker is I think, uh, Professor Jung and the Bra for University of Oslo. Unfortunately, I don't have too much information about the him, so um, so I cannot introduce and uh, not much. So I probably gonna ask the Dr. Bra to give himself and uh, in a brief introduction before his talk. So he's on the tight and the talk of title of his talk is the Sky Skyne Up the DHS. DHSIS to COVID-19 surveillance system globally. So talk about the you know, potential use of these other system software. Dr. Bro. Uh, yes, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Jörn Bro, professor at the University of Oslo, and been working with uh, this DHS2 and what I will talk about today then, the HISP network. Since, since it started a long time back in South Africa in the 90s. So today I will, I will talk about uh, a continue where 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 uh, Bamod uh, ended and talk about uh, more about how it is uh, scaled across uh, countries and uh, that how the speed and the scale is both based on the fact that uh, the DHS2 is a platform already used in countries, but as much because we have, have this capacity that, uh, that uh, we are building on. And uh, I am now managing the slides, so I will start with, uh, with uh, this uh, overview of uh, the DHS2 as it is used uh, in countries. And as you can see, a large number of countries are using uh, DHS2. And if you look at the timeline there, uh, I said that it started in South Africa in the 90s, but that was the first version, the 
DHS2 was uh, Microsoft Office access based, so it was standalone. But the web based DHS2 started in 2006 in, in, uh, in uh, Kerala and has grown in the same pace as, as in the beginning, uh, in the pace as, uh, as we have seen that uh, uh, the internet has grown also across, across the world. And if you look at that as a kind of a base, I mean, a platform base for, for what follows now, namely the, the implementation uh, of DHS2 for the COVID-19 and as an information response to the, to the COVID-19. And we see that there's, uh, many, many countries are actually using, using uh, the already established platform of DHS2 to add on uh, the apps and the modules uh, of, of, of COVID-19, uh, contact tracing, uh, port of entry uh, registration, uh, ICU beds, uh, etc. Uh, tracking. So this is this is kind of the background of the, of the technical aspects of, of the of, of the platform, and uh, more generally, we call it the HISP and DHS2 network. HISP is actually standing for Health Information System Program. It's uh, it's a uh, it's a network of of uh, universities, uh, NGOs, Ministry of Health, etc. In in many many countries, a global network for development and open source software uh, implementation and development and education and research. There's a number of HISP groups, as uh, Pamol mentioned. Sri Lanka is one of these countries with a HISP group. They're doing implementation support and uh, development and, and implementation in countries and supporting countries. And what is also extremely important in this context is that it's also linked to master programs and PhD programs. Sri Lanka is a good example of that where the masters in health informatics has been a very important part of building capacity in Sri Lanka and also to, to build uh, these uh, uh, DHS2 COVID-19 apps that we have seen. Also, the, Sri Lanka is part of, of the PhD program globally, uh, which is part of this uh, HISP network. So the DHS2 open source uh, software platform, it's about the reporting as, as, as we have uh, heard from, uh, from Sri Lanka, reporting, uh, analysis and dissemination of health data and the tracking of, of individuals or, or and even of things like ECU beds. As I mentioned, it started in uh, South Africa in the 90s and now whether it's more than 50 or more than 70, it's many, many, many countries that are using the DHIS2. Core funding is from uh, NORAD, so that's the Norwegian aid agency, but also partners, uh, important partners at like WHO, CDC, PEPFAR, Global Fund, Gavi, UNICEF. Very important partners in this uh, project. This is a display of what we call the three components of, of the HISP uh, network of action or the HISP program. You see free and open source software in combination with building capacity uh, from actually from in-service training of health workers all the way up to uh, masters and PhDs. And it's research in health information systems, uh, standardization, use of information for action, uh, information for health management, for uh, patient uh, care. And you see also the the, the, the kind of sy symbolic of, of the countries that are part of this network, like Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Mozambique, uh, Vietnam, so mainly in Africa and Asia. And I will, in this presentation, also give some examples from, from uh, La PDR, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and also other countries. If you look at uh, what DHS2 is providing, uh, 
at the core level and at the COVID-19 level, we have the core DHS2 software, where you have core data models as an open platform. You have uh, uh, what we call a flexible uh, metadata that you can actually design yourself. I mean, you can design your, your, your uh, data elements, your indicators, your, you can configure your health system from, from the health facilities all the way up to the province and the national level. And it's also then a platform through an API you can, you can access, so you can build apps on top of the platform. And uh, when it comes to these uh, modules uh, for, for COVID, it's also working on top of this, this uh, platform. There's also an Android DHS2 uh, uh, app that you can, you can use out of the box. And we have what we call metadata packages, which I will come back to uh, in, a, in a later slide. Similar to the COVID-19 packages, we have also, also packages on, on immunization, HIV AIDS, TB, etc. And we have the training modules which is, uh, which is uh, mostly conducted by way of, of uh, DHIS2 academies around a regional level, a uh, country level. And Sri Lanka has hosted several such academies. We are working together with, uh, with the WHO on uh, what they call uh, health data standards packages and which is also including uh, what we uh, can call DHS2, Digital Health Data Toolkit. And these are program, health program uh, specific uh, uh, packages, which includes then uh, metadata and also uh, guidelines for, for using it, metadata packages that can be downloaded, uh, training materials, etc. And you see here the different, different, uh, different uh, modules, the different packages there are: mortality, uh, HIV, TB, malaria, immunization, morbidity, etc. And you also have a very popular data quality review uh, app, which you can actually use to to find outliers and check and control uh, quality of your own all data. These are uh, the apps that you are, or, or the modules that you is included in, in the COVID-19 uh, uh, app, which also Pamod uh, mentioned. You have uh, case-based surveillance, point of entry, contact tracing, uh, etc. And also important, you have, have the COVID-19 uh, surveillance dashboard, which gives an overview of, of, uh, of the situation in terms of uh, number of cases and updated day by day so that you see the trends as at this actual time. So if you look at more into exactly what it means this uh, toolkit. I mentioned that it's a metadata package. It's a installable uh, JSON files, which is actually con containing the complete DHS2 configuration. Of course, this, this, this uh, configuration is an additional addition to the WHO standards, which are say, uh, software neutral. So this, this is a, a configuration uh, package for those who are using DHIS2. And you can see that the fact that 70 plus countries are using DHIS2, then the packages by way of com configuration in a DHIS2 uh, platform, it's a very useful way to rapidly disseminate uh, 
standard, health data standards. And that is the background, much of the background for the rapid scaling of, of this uh, COVID-19 uh, packages using the using the DHIS2. And uh, also in the metadata package, you have dashboards with the indicators, uh, data sets, data elements, uh, etc. And it's coded according to WHO uh, COVID-19 case-based uh, data dictionary. SNOMED, SNOMED will, will also be, is also uh, being developed and that, that will come later. So it's modular so that the case you have, you, you, you can select which module to use. I mean, not everybody are using all uh, modules. And the point is that it gives the freedom and as Pamod uh, mentioned, there are also possibility to develop further uh, modules like case-based surveillance, port of entry uh, uh, surveillance, contact tracing, etc. And all these are, uh, are translated into multiple uh, languages. Of course, uh, uh, English, Fran uh, French, Portuguese, but when it comes to implementation in, in Asia, at least east, east of Sri Lanka, uh, it's very important to have the local languages because uh, uh, East, east Asia, Southeast Asia has a plethora of, of, of languages. So the languages are very important. And it's also including documentation, installation guides, and system design guides uh, linking this design uh, decision with, with the, with the WHO uh, technical guidance so that you have a link between the, the, the DHIS2 design and the technical uh, guidance from, from WHO. And we have a uh, part of this, it's also end user, end user training templates, uh, both for the user training like uh, uh, data entry, but also for data analytics and the use of indicators, etc. And this is based on the on the general uh, uh, guidelines for an analysis of data in these particular areas uh, from the WHO. So all this to put all this into uh, a toolkit is something that has been developed together with the uh, HIST groups in countries and regions, like, like, like in Sri Lanka, Pamod told about in the previous uh, presentation. If you look at the system development uh, process and implementation process of the DHIS2, we have uh, a sequence of global releases, so that you have a version point 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, etc. That has been going on for years. And for every new release, new requirements or bug fi fixes also, of course, that are, uh, have been generated through local use are being included. Like, like you can see in this, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, figure that uh, local innovation is kind of uh, floating upwards to the global product release uh, at a later stage. As we will, we will use the example we have learned from from uh, Pamu there to see how how this is actually actually happening. And we can see here that uh, in the in, in the in the midfield here you see that. Our example is that Sri Lanka have developed uh, uh, a network of contact uh, tracing uh, module. And if you look at the bottom, uh, bottom uh, right corner, is a display of this, this, uh, this uh, module or, or the visualization, visualization of contact tracing. We will see how uh, one positive case leads to a contact which need to be registered and checked out or in to, to, the, to, to, to the system. And 
the point here is that Indonesia adapt. Indonesia just started with with uh, implementing uh, implementing uh, the HRS2 for COVID-19 uh, tracking uh, in November last last month. But one of the first things they started to use was actually this app developed in 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 uh, Sri Lanka. And I had a little con conversation with with uh, colleagues in, in in Indonesia this morning. And you see here uh, the activity of the contact tracing in Indonesia, Indonesia today. Of course, it's only you can see that it's only basically implemented uh, northern uh, Sumatra and uh, Java Island around uh, Jakarta, etc. And you see uh, the Sri Lanka app uh, adopted and adapted to the to the uh, to the situation in Indonesia. Up in the, up in the corner, there. and I think that is a good example of how innovations are floating around in in this network, and and how things developed, for example, in, in Sri Lanka, can be uh, taken into use also in other countries. And this is uh, this is a uh, dashboard from from Indonesia, where you have an update of positive cases, contact tracing. And you have the graphs up updated to the actual moment you are looking at it, and uh, so they have a plan in, in uh, now. They have uh, implemented in 10, 10 provinces in Indonesia. The plan is to reach all all th thirty four provinces as soon as possible. I wanted to show you an example, a big example from from uh, from Bangladesh, illustrating both my points. One is that this is an uh, overview of. Uh, I got these uh, slides also this morning from through a, uh, through a, a conversation with our, our colleagues in in Bangladesh in the His Bangladesh, and this slide shows how the health sector is actually using the DHS2 system, meaning that you have a. Uh, foundation that is there and has been de developed and uh, maintained over many, many years. I mean, five, ten years. And you see that uh, many sectors of the uh, are, are using the DHS2 as their general health information system, which is then, uh, as you will see, a good platform for implementing or adapting and implementing the COVID-19 uh, features from, from, from the global network. And, and the, his Bangladesh uh, took up these uh, COVID-19 packages already in, in March and adapted to their uh, particular uh, uh, structure of health system and, and uh, needs together with the Minister of Health. And you see then all this is carried out by, by HISP Bangladesh, which is then uh, parallel to HISP Sri Lanka and HISP Vietnam and HISP, uh, HISP in, in other co countries. And this is an uh, update of, of how the COVID-19 surveillance system is actually implemented in, in, uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, they have all, all COVID-19 information in one place. And they have had more than 2 million case-based record uh, included, reported from a number of, of health facilities and, and uh, laboratories. They have a system where test results are notified to to uh, to the client to the suspect uh, through uh, SMS automatically. They provide the COVID nineteen certificate with the I mean, electronically and using QR code also used by by when you are traveling and uh, and taking a plane for example in Bangladesh you, you are supposed to provide such a, such a electronic uh, uh, certificate. They have uh, the ability to provide these uh, certificates uh, quickly, within 48 hours. And of course, they used all this data for uh, 
for analysis on uh, distribution in, 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 in uh, geography and over time, as we see graphical up, up there at the dashboard, you see the similar dashboard as I showed you from, 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 from uh, uh, Indonesia. There, that's, a, that's a standard dashboard that they are using. And this is a graph uh, of, of uh, cases, positive tests in, in, uh, in Bangladesh as of, of, uh, as of uh, yesterday is written there. They have uh, by yesterday 479,743 confirmed positive COVID-19 cases and 6,874 deaths. So we see that the rapid uh, and very, very comprehensive implementation of, of COVID-19 packages and, and features in Bangladesh have two foundations. One, capacity, is uh, Bangladesh, and the platform already there uh, as, as being used generally in the health sector. So these, these are actually my, my, my two points, that you have human capacity and you have the platform, that, which is enabling uh, this rapid scale of, of the COVID-19 in the, using the DHS2 system. We move to a smaller country, uh, Lao PDR. You see here, this, they are also uh, using uh, DHS2 in, uh, in a number of ways for, for their, uh, in their health sector and have implemented uh, the COVID-19 packages. You see here also on, on the, uh, with, with the with the data collection form for uh, hospital bed and treatment uh, resource, uh, what they call a treatment resource uh, tracker. I mean, uh, like like we saw also from from uh, from Sri Lanka, they are tracking the ICU beds and 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 other other uh, availability of other services and and uh, technical features. They have uh, their. Uh, dashboard where they can follow, as we have seen from the other countries also, up-to-date data for from across the country also based on uh, geography. Not so many uh, cases, uh, positive cases in, in Sri Lanka and uh, mostly uh, imported cases. Contrary to what we saw in, in Bangladesh with the cases in the hundred thousands. So it, you can see that it can be used uh, at a low load level and at a high load level. Let's have a look at uh, what's happening in, in Africa. Uh, Uganda is one of the countries that uh, were very quick in, in, in uh, implementing the COVID-19 uh, uh, system from, on the DHS2 platform. And the special, special uh, feature in many of these uh, African countries is that they, are, they have these uh, land border crossing points. And they are landlocked uh, countries and they depend on truck drivers coming with the loads of, of goods uh, to, to, to the country. And what they have done in order to, uh, to manage that problem is that they has focused on these uh, uh, border points and they have developed a system of where they have a certificate. They, they, they test uh, and, and control and follow the truck drivers through their countries. And some of these truck drivers are driving through the country to the next country. And this here they have generated an electronic uh, travel pass, which has enabled this, this uh, system of tracking the drivers, tracking the trucks through the country. So that is uh, a very uh, typical feature in, in the, in the uh, border control, uh, port of entry control in, in African countries. And the similar is done in other, other countries. And uh, here you see uh, 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 
picture of robots uh, <laughs> testing uh, people in, in Rwanda. And if you click on this, this, uh, uh, this uh, link that is uh, given here, you can see uh, information uh, information uh, video on, on what they are doing in, in Rwanda. And uh, also in Rwanda, they have DHS2 as a national scale system for HMIS since two, 2012, in fact. And uh, the COVID-19 apps uh, have been quite easily implemented on top of that. And they're using uh, the Android uh, app for, for, for the lab uh, sample uh, collection uh, to communicate on the quarantine, current quarantine uh, sites and uh, many other things. So, th so the Rwanda, they have developed and implemented a, a, a very wide uh, scale of, of the features uh, for, for COVID-19 using the DHIS2. And the uh, laboratory is, is an important kind of nucleus in their, their uh, implementation. I will finish off with, with the last, last example from, from, uh, from these different countries with, uh, with Norway. Uh, you saw Pamud uh, mentioned what the uh, Norwegian Prime Minister said about Sri Lanka. There's also a quote from, uh, from uh, a journal uh, at the same time that when, uh, when Norway used pen uh, or pen and paper, uh, Sri Lanka had already implemented the electronic uh, uh, tracking system because uh, Norway were, was a bit slow in 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 uh, in coming up with a, with a good a good uh, uh, response to the COVID nineteen. I mean information response. Uh, as every municipality in Norway is kind of inventing their own uh, uh, tools and doing it in their own way. That it were no national system, and that. The, that was then the, the opportunity to, uh, for, for the University of Oslo to work with the, uh, with the, with the municipalities to actually implement uh, DHIS2 also in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Norway, in the, in the different uh, municipalities. And uh, actually there's a company in, in Norway that have taken the DHIS2 and, and uh, developed a, a smoother uh, user interface on top of it and it's actually making their living from, from selling this around uh, uh, in the different uh, municipalities. Whereas uh, University of Oslo, our, our people in, in the, in the DHS2 lab is, is, is supporting uh, uh, 10, 20, 30 municipalities. So uh, it's, it's actually, the idea and one of the reasons for, for Norway to, to focus strongly on this uh, uh, contact tracing now was that that the better the contact tracing, the earlier is it possible to open up slowly the society. And that is, that is the driver, driver behind this. So let me let me uh, just uh, finish uh, with some 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 uh, final words uh, on, on uh, where are we going from here. I think uh, one thing that uh, is important in, is that some I haven't mentioned so far is that uh, we know that in the in the most countries disease surveillance is in one department and say the HMIS and other, other health information services are in different departments. So very often you don't really have a good uh, integration of disease surveillance into the general information system. So, so that is one of the, one of the important uh, next steps in my view is to be better to integrate uh, the routine, I mean, the 
uh, now is the, is the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, later it might be other pandemics and other specific diseases that we want to, 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 to uh, establish a surveillance system about. And it's important to integrate the di different, different uh, surveillance systems with this uh, more crisis-oriented oriented, uh, COVID-19 uh, inform information systems. And as important is to enable innovations in countries and help countries to, to uh, make their innovations uh, generic so that they can be taken up uh, globally. As we have seen from this uh, very good example uh, illustrated very well uh, from Sri Lanka and, and how it's even taken up in, in, in Indonesia and of course other places. So that is always a challenge because uh, innovations in countries uh, are happening, but very often the, the innovations will remain there because uh, they, the, the, the innovations and the features, uh, even using the DHS too, must be very specifically uh, linked to that context. So what we saw in, 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 uh, in uh, Sri Lanka was that once people in other countries saw what happened in Sri Lanka and was interested in doing something similar, then a collaboration uh, came about to make the Sri Lanka solution generic so that it could more easily be uh, adapted also in other countries. So, uh, Finally, uh, I think it's, it's uh, very important to, to, uh, to, to understand that this uh, capacity and network and what we can call a collaborative network, uh, network of action uh, that we have seen in this case of HISP and DHIS2, that is a very important part of, of uh, the success of rapid uh, scaling of, of, of the COVID-19 uh, app using the DHIS2 platform. Platform alone without people and, and the capacity is, uh, is, is of no, no use and uh, will not move anywhere. So uh, I think I will, uh, will stop here as I have used my, uh, my time. So thank you, thank you very much. And as we have learned to say in this COVID time, over, over and out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sion, uh, for the comprehensive presentation on uh, different systems from different countries and the experience. Uh, now we are moving to the next presentation uh, that is responding to the COVID-19 pandemic with the di digital health technologies and presentation led by Professor Ajit Disanayaka, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, and uh, who is also a past president of SLMA and also uh, someone who has done pioneering work related to implementing medical informatics in the country. Over to you, Ajit. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Chairman, uh, for those kind words of introduction. It is uh, indeed um, heartening to follow both uh, Pramod and um, uh, Yon um, uh, um, because Yon uh, um, and myself and my colleagues have been collaborating for a long time. And then, of course, uh, Pramod is a product of the uh, uh, Master's in Biomedical Informatics and the uh, MD in Health Informatics programs that uh, you heard about. So um, today in, the, in preparation to this talk, um, I reflected on uh, some of the work that we've been doing. And so uh, I'm going to um, give you um, kind of an overview of responding to the COVID-19 pandemic with digital health solution, and also try to ground it on some of the work that we've done here in Sri Lanka, as well as um, uh, also, uh, put it in a global context and see how we've um, the work that we've gone um, has been taken globally, as well as how we have, uh, uh, you know, worked uh, in terms of um, strengthening health systems and informing the process of strengthening health systems. 
So um, when we talk of, or uh, when we deliberate on, uh, um, you know, theme of uh, public health in the new normal, what is um, fascinating or what is interesting about the new normal is the prominent role that digital technologies are playing in the new normal. And we, in the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, which actually uh, celebrated 150 years this year, um, as well as uh, our Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, during the past 10 to 12 years, actually starting in 2008, have been working on uh, producing what we call a generation of leaders in biomedical and health informatics in Sri Lanka with the expertise in both the health domain and the ICT domain who would spearhead the development of ICT in the healthcare services in Sri Lanka working with and under the guidance of the decision makers at the highest level. Our masters and um, MD programs are built around a specialty board in biomedical informatics at the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, uh, which I have had the privilege of founding and chairing uh, for the past uh, 12 years. HISL or the Health Informatics Society of Sri Lanka is the uh, professional association for our biomedical and health informaticians. And then we've had a strong collaboration with the University of Oslo. Our main uh, partner is uh, the um, Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health encourages their doctors to come to our program. They give them the course fee and two years paid leave to come and follow a master's in biomedical informatics, after which they go on to become medical officers in uh, medical informatics in the Ministry of Health system. What's interesting is about our master's program is that in the second year, it's um, devoted to action research. And I have a collaboration with the University of Oslo and the team led by Jan and Sandeep and Karsin have really helped us because their model of action research has been adopted by us. And over the past 12 years, all our public health um, information systems in the country that have scaled up and uh, been deployed in the uh, Ministry of Health system has grown out of this program. Almost all, I would say 99%. The medical officers, once they've, you know, take their innovations in the master's program and deploy them in the ministry and uh, work with it for a little while, come back to us and do a MD. And at the end of the MD, they go on to become board certified health informatics specialists. So I'm proud to say that after the US, we had a program of board certifying clinical uh, informaticians. Sri Lanka was the second country in the world to um, develop such a program. And uh, it has helped enormously um, in our response to the pandemic. And as you saw from the talks of um, Pamod and um, Yon, we've also contributed globally. Over the past 12 years, we have produced more than 200 graduates uh, more um, with the MSc, more than 40 going on to do the MD and so on. And this is a group of them at one of our conferences. We've captured our experience on the invitation of the World Health Organization in a perspective paper that we wrote, which is published in the WHO Southeast Asia Journal of Public Health. And I'd like to invite anyone who's interested in learning our model a little bit more to uh, look at the paper and to reach out to us and we'll be happy to help you uh, cast any program along the lines that we have done. We believe that digital health solutions 
should be built by health professionals in partnership with the ICT community. Biomedical and health informaticians should lead this process because digital health is a tool which should be used where appropriate. Our mantra is that our aim is health, not digital health, and we believe that the doctors, once they become board certified health informaticians, are in the ideal position to make sure that the um, digital technologies that we use actually turn into the health gains that we expect for our population. So it is in that context that we started responding to the COVID-19 pandemic with digital health solutions in our country. Now I told you that the uh, masters and MD programs that we had contributed immensely towards this response. The reason for that was the strong focus that we had on innovation. We'd like to call our innovation frugal innovation. Low cost, highly effective, scalable and sustainable innovation. They are so because they are developed on open source platforms using open standards, meeting a local need, they are custom built and interoperable and they are Ministry of Health owned and maintained. And that has helped us immensely. So it is in that this background that we uh, or our graduates of our, pro of our program were, you know, bringing about various innovations in the country. And what was highlighted was uh, the work that was done on uh, the COVID um, on um, DHIS2 platform, which has actually grown global. So around uh, the month of January this year, when we were thinking of what was um, what we should be doing as illustrated by um, uh, Pamod really there were we realized that there were few areas to focus on one the greatest challenge at that time seemed to be surveillance and um, i can remember the team Pamod and uh, Roshan and the others Hush huddling together and trying to figure out how we go forward. And um, what they did led to the DHIS2 COVID-19 package, which, as you saw, has grown, uh, gone global. Second uh, innovation that we perceived at that time as the surveillance kind of began and people were moving now into dealing with the issues of self-health checking and um, self-isolation, quarantine and so on was exactly that. Self-health checking, self-isolation, quarantine tracking, management. These are the things that we really deal with and uh, grapple with even today. And that led to a second innovation, which our team in Sri Lanka did, in collaboration with the Commonwealth Center for Digital Health that um, I chair, the self health uh, self shield system. The system is an app which enables people to uh, download it freely from the App Store and Google Play, and use it to perform self-health checkings. So they can look at the symptoms, you can track your symptoms, you can um, look at uh, and monitor your breath, uh, breath, uh, breath uh, sounds and breath performance, breathing performance. And then of course, you can also um, you know, do a psychosocial um, status evaluation. And I've put the local language content here deliberately because the system is customizable uh, to any of the languages. 
uh, local languages wherever it's deployed um, and that's um, been one of the um, advantages especially when it comes to the psychosocial uh, status then of course through a system of dashboards the user can get feedback and that can be used individually then the system can also be used by health systems to monitor their self-isolation and quarantine programs so the users who freely download the app if they are uh, living in an area where the health system has adopted the app can give consent to enroll in the program in their locality and what that does it it enables immediately for the person to be enrolled into the program using even uh, uh, facial recognition and so on so that we know uh, who is enrolled and then they the back end which is monitored by the health services can be now used um, to monitor people in uh, isolation and in quarantine using a system of dashboards and uh, this system has been um, utilized in uh, limited scale locally in Sri Lanka but and has also been used by some companies who want to monitor their staff. So, ladies and gentlemen, our program of Fugal Innovation enabled us to make what I could say two significant contributions one on surveillance, the other looking at self health checking and self isolation and quarantine tracking and management. Moving on a little bit further. Now, while working on these with our work in the Commonwealth, we realized that we had an opportunity for doing advocacy. And this advocacy work goes uh, back a few, um, uh, go, goes back a little. Um, it goes to um, uh, way back, in fact, to 2016, when we uh, uh, when we started the Commonwealth Digital Health Initiative um, during the 24th Triennial Conference of the Commonwealth Medical Association, which was hosted by the Sri Lanka Medical Association. This was also, in fact, the first Commonwealth Digital Health Conference. And the outcome of that was the Colombo Declaration uh, for a plan for collaborative action which have been used widely for advocacy purposes by various Commonwealth organizations. And one little bit, one item in this was the item six, where we advocated promoting partnerships through scaling up of digital health technologies to respond to disease outbreaks, such as the COVID pandemic. The ideas that we generated at this meeting were taken next year to the Commonwealth Health Ministers through what we call a Commonwealth Policy Brief on Digital Systems for One Health. And uh, this was adopted by the Commonwealth Health Ministers in May 2017. There we again promulgated the idea of responding to pandemics with digital technologies. Now the concept of One Health came about into these policy briefs deliberately because we realized the, you know, cap the need to capture all dimensions of health and the definition of One Health is here. And you would uh, realize the importance of capturing that concept uh, into the work that we do, especially in terms of advocacy. Moving further, in 2018, we launched the Commonwealth Center for Digital Health in London on the sidelines of the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, where again, we deliberated on innovation and investments for One Health and universal health coverage. 
we took that further and started working with the interaction council so the interaction council is the association of former world leaders and here we see in the sidelines of the uh, planetary health conference in edinburgh in 2018 led by Gertie Ahern, the former Prime Minister of uh, Ireland, all of us working in the space met and um, promoted the work that we were doing on digital systems for One Health. Now, when we are using digital technologies, we need to realize that uh, an app by itself is not going to solve every problem. They need to be a part of a health system and they should be used to strengthen health systems so to base our work on digital technologies we used another framework a systems framework for healthy policy which again uh, the commonwealth health ministers had adopted now, this has a lot of background. Uh, it's been used by the um, uh, other organizations as well. And we've adopted this framework. The framework is a framework to advocate global health security and sustainable health uh, well being for all. It has what we call systems enablers, which are illustrated here. And the core services which are illustrated in this this slide we started working last year on a project where we were trying to map everything digital on the health space onto this framework in the beginning of this year we had a team of our MD graduates going to the hub of the Commonwealth Centre for Digital Health in the University of Southampton in UK. This is the team. And their mandate was to uh, build a digital platform for universal health systems for what we call the planet, place and people. As the COVID pandemic struck, we decided to focus on focus our initial efforts on digital solutions aimed at covid so what we call a covid digital solutions platform we started building this this was around january february this year there was a methodology that we adopted to look at all the solutions that were coming out there at that time we had a set of evaluation criteria as well and these criteria had been developed by us over the past four or five years working on another project that we did that was the commonwealth digital health awards and um, by way of uh, information to the participants if you would like to go and uh, take a look at the commonwealth digital health awards at the um, url on youtube that i shown you it was held a couple of weeks ago uh, on Saturday, uh, you would see some of the innovations that came um, that we uh, that we recognize, including the ones related to COVID. But using that framework that we used to evaluate awards, we evaluated um, and of course broad basing it to sit on health systems. We evaluated the tools that were coming out at that time, and created this. COVID digital solutions platform that you can go and take a look at. And every innovation, not only our ones, but the others coming out were evaluated on this framework. Here are some examples. So when we look at these solutions, what we were trying to do was to see which elements of the governance and the core systems deliveries were being covered. And as you can see, when you look at uh, the um, uh, DHIS2 platform that you heard about, 
we were focused those that platform was focusing on uh, protection and prevention in terms of the core service areas and of course there was a governance knowledge and advocacy areas also covered and um, you can return back to my slides and look at some of the urls that i've given here so you can you know follow them and see uh, the these innovations and how they sit on the systems framework and as i told you and has been told several times these in uh, the uh, the dhi system by far i believe is the most widely adopted system that was developed uh, in response to the covid pandemic and uh, um, people like yon and pramod and the rest of the team should take credit for that then of course um we um, we also looked at what the uk government was doing and you could see that the focus there again was on protection and prevention uh because this was that was uh, understood because people wanted to identify uh, 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 patients um, who were developing symptoms, they wanted to do surveillance, so that's where the focus was. Moving further, um, you've got the, uh, we've, we've got the system from Australia, again, focusing on uh, protection and prevention, contact tracing, and so on, isolation. Um, more details of their system, again, I'll leave it for you to uh, take a look leisurely then of course singapore singapore once again focusing on uh, protection and prevention with their app trace together coming to sri lanka my health the my health app was deployed by the government of sri lanka and um, what was interesting about uh, the my health app was that it didn't only focus on protection and prevention but the platform the app was used as a platform for delivering services so the app was opened up to the private telehealth provided who, providers who started providing their telehealth services free on the platform so a platform which was primarily aimed at protection and prevention uh, also then went into um, you know health promotion as well as providing core health services telehealth services so you can see how then the uh, these um, uh, when you really evaluate uh, a product on a framework you see the greater uh, applicability of these products this is uh, these are the links to more details on that then of course the self shield app that i was talking about earlier again it had a wider scope, not just prevention and protection, promotion, as well as, of course, if the back end uh, was enabled, you could also be do providing people centered services. But as a product that you download from the web st uh, or App Store or Google Play, it will not uh, provide those services. It's only if you're part of a network that part of a health system that's using the app that that would become useful. So, ladies and gentlemen, in the past few minutes, I took you to a lot of stuff. You could, uh, you could, uh, I took you through what we've done and how what we did uh, in uh, biomedical and health informatics enabled us uh, to move into innovation that has helped us as help, as well as helped the world. Showed you also other aspects of the innovations that we could do, and then I've also taken you to the realm of advocacy, where I've shown you how we could um, really look at all these products that are coming out in terms of a framework and see how we can adapt them into our systems. And uh, so for that, we develop the COVID Digital Solutions Platform. But going further, uh, to remind you, our initial aim was something much more bigger, to look at all the products out there. Um, as much as possible and to see how those products could be put together in the health systems framework so that people could use it effectively in their strength to strengthen their health systems we have started work on that and just 
last week on the 3rd we launched the platform for planet plays and the people and i've given the url uh for that as well with the uh, youtube link for the launch and i would like to invite you to go and take a look uh at all um at the, uh, at uh, um, at the launch because there are, we brought in all the partners including the world health organization as well as the international telecom union and um, other key players uh, that we are working with so that um, we've now created a product that people can use you can go there and get guidance on how digital systems can be used to strengthen your health systems so with those words ladies and gentlemen i'd like to thank you for your patient um, uh, listening i'd like to end by thanking professor indika karunathilaka and the organizing committee as well as the president and the secretary general of the um, association um, the coalition for having given us the opportunity to showcase what is happening in the digital world at this conference and i hope that what you put together what we put together for you um to this evening was useful and that it would generate further ideas and discussion and we would be happy to work with you all uh, going forward uh, to help strengthen your health systems during the covid pandemic and beyond thank you very much thank you professor vajire disanayaka showing how open source and easily available uh, material and resources could be used for the frugal solutions or maybe the if if you really look for even with resource restricted countries the resources are actually there if you really look for so thank you for showing so many examples based on that and i think all the three presentations the message was very clear that there is definitely a need and if you really look for the resources are easily available and if you have the capacity and competency the sky is the limit uh, with that we will conclude this session uh, because of the interest of time we will not have time for questions however if the participants have any questions then uh, they can put them on the chat or even email uh, since this is a symposium on digital technology and covid-19 pandemic i would like to take one or two minutes uh, because this conference is also a few years ago we haven't thought about apac conference going totally digital or hybrid so now this has become a reality uh, now in line with what was presented that what could be done even within uh, resource restricted settings what could be done with the limited is available uh, there are very clear demonstrations now related to the apac conference also i would like to make one demonstration that how we have created a 3d virtual environment in the apac conference yes now uh, you many of you are aware of the apac the reflections proto exhibition but this time it has been converted into a completely virtual 3d immersive experience where you can go through the photos and then see them so that is one area and uh, even the even the oral presentation so the scientific presentation this time uh, there were record number of 240 oral presentations that were presented during the conference and they too were converted within a 3d virtual immersive experience that was done within the resources that we had within sri lanka you see now our expertise uh, that is available within the faculty of medicine and slma so again just to highlight that nothing is impossible if you have the capacity competency and the required resources if i can share the screen yes yeah, it's there now you may see even the oral presentations you can move into these different presentations and then again when you click on that you can see the video playing so that will be a virtual immersive experience and similarly for the photo exhibition also if you move into this and if you go into those areas you can see the photos that are there
So that immersive experience is open and now all of you can experience this for the first time maybe in an international conference just to show what could be done. Okay, so Ron, uh, for your concluding remarks. Uh, I think uh, you, you already talked uh, quite a lot. It's really good. I'm really you know, so pleased to see on the, you know, the, the system and the developed and from the, you know, like uh, the Norway uh, being used by many countries and uh, like Sri Lanka, for example, adopted to use the, pro the program, the systems to facilitate their reporting and uh, sharing the data on national wide and also in the regions. So that is really, really, really encouraging. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, maybe hopefully some on the, you know, design uh, the program can be uh, used in the, you know, like other more larger countries, for example, I think uh, most of the design, uh, you know, like uh, the application for this and uh, the DHIS and the two in the Africa and uh, in the Asia countries, that's hopeful and, uh, you know, that can be, you know, I don't know what it, you know, like uh, maybe the limitation can be used in the, some other countries, like uh, bigger countries or more developed countries. So they can use the same system and, uh, you know, like uh, reporting the, the same disease and uh, so you you enhance you know the understanding and uh, you know collaboration or do something together and uh, like uh, this COVID nineteen typically good examples and uh, we need to work together global wise. Yeah. So it's very, very good. I think the technology now you know it become available. So I think uh, the government and uh, you know like and uh, really taking the need and uh, for the nations and. Uh, to use or to adapt in you know, some kind of systems, like you guys did very well. So, hoof and uh, you know the with you know the, all the people working together. I think that that is COVID nineteen, and right now seems still making not about the trouble and uh, got so many infections still. Uh, so if we have a very good system, the sharing the data, the manage you know the reporting the data and uh, to share some kind of a good and effective management way. So now we'll be very helpful to stop and uh, reduce and uh, you know, spread in control the disease. So I think uh, it's really good uh, for the, the media organization to have this section here, you know, uh, to share some information and uh, with uh, quite a, uh, you know, the audience from different regions. I don't know how many uh, the you know, people from, you know, like, uh, we have quite a lot of their audience here, but I don't know where it's all, maybe most of them from Sri Lanka, but they might have, hopefully have some other regions too, can get some information. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's uh, Excellent. international participants also, uh, there are several international participants also who are logged in at the moment as well. So uh, with that, we conclude this session. I thank my co-chair, uh, Yuan and Lu, uh, from University of Hawaii, USA, and uh, the three speakers, Dr. Pramod Amarakon and uh, Professor Yon Ro and Professor Vajira Disanayaka for the excellent presentations and showing the way forward. Thank you. And with that, we conclude the session. And uh, from here onwards, the participants can have access to the 3D virtual environments and navigate them and uh, go through the photo exhibition as well as the oral presentations. I request you to do so because uh, the accessibility and the number of access uh, to the photo exhibition as well as to the presentations will be helpful for us to decide who are the winners for the Young Investigator Award as well as the photo exhibition. Thank you.